can do after this presentation, you know more about how to do the prognosis. So you will know that it cannot be accurately determined immediately after the injury. We have to wait a couple of days for the uh, more specific uh, prognosis. The MRI and ultrasound have no added value, so you can throw them away for the prognosis and um, repeated clinical evaluation is the best we have at the moment. Then if we look at the treatment and prevention, it's an active approach with eccentric therapy, exercise therapy it is. So, and after it, we go on with the return to play. It's a shared decision making with the athlete, the team coach, the physical therapist, the sports physician, and the rehab trainer or fitness trainer. And if all is good, criteria are based on a medical clearance and the context, of course, depending which team you're in and which games are ahead. So let's start about the introduction. I'm going to tell you something about hamstrings and their anatomy. I think you will all know it, so we can go fast on that part. After we go to the diagnosis, the prognosis, the rehab, return to play and the prevention. So these are the hamstrings, um, the knee flexors and hip extension. It are four muscles. Um, most of them have their origin in the ischial tuberosity and go to um, or the medial part of the tibia or more the lateral side, so the fibula head. And then only the bicep femoris with the short head um, will uh, start from the linea aspera of the femur. Knowing this, then we have a lot of information data uh, about male professional football, because that's what we're talking about today. Um, everything is about professional football from the Champions League uh, clubs, all the data I am presenting. Um, so the UEFA has a, for already more than 20 years the elite club injury study meeting and every year after the season they uh, present the data they get, get from the Champions League clubs um, to provide uh, new research um, outcomes with it. If we look at the hamstring, it's the most prevalent football muscle injury, 12% of all injuries and a really high recurrence rate from 12 to 30% within the first year. And there's a really high injury burden for the Champions League clubs. That means that like for a player, if you have a hamstring injury, you will be out for like 18 days or you will miss three matches. Um, if we look from club perspective, five or six hamstring injuries, you will have each season in one team in your professional Champions League team. And this means that 50 matches or like 19 days are missed due to this hamstring problems in your teams. And every season there's a 4% increase in the hamstring problems due to the fact of busy schedule, more games, less rest. That's what we think. If we look at the injury burden in general for the Champions League clubs, we know that higher match availability give, are significant associated with higher final league rankings, more points per league match and a higher UEFA coefficient. So for head coaches, it's really important to have as much players available because in the end it's all about getting prices and higher rankings and get the, the titles. So this is for the head coach interesting and for all the other people, of course also the president, to know that when your players are more available, um, you will end up higher in your ranking in general. Of course it will differ in season to season, but if we look at this season at our club, um, like almost no injuries in the first team and I think the season was pretty good. Um, and then average cost for an injured player in a Champions League team, so just Champions League teams, is half a million. So if it's like one month out, it's like um, half a million money lose, so lost. So also that's important to keep our players fit and on the field working where they should work. Then if we look at the hamstring injuries, we have like this different onset. We have gradual and the acute onset. 
then we if it's gradual it's most of the time delayed onset muscle soreness or just overuse nothing really really bad then we have the direct traumas and the indirect um, i don't know if most of you know this um, hamstring injury it's an old one 1981 uh, so i will show you but it's one of the old one which due to the shoe gear at that moment luckily at this moment we will not see it anymore um <laughs> Match day two of the 1981-1982 season. Werder Bremen host Armenia Bielefeld, and 20 minutes into the game, Ebert Lienen is fouled by Norbert Siegmund. The Bremen defender is booked, and the Bielefeld attacker screams with pain. Lienen has a 10-inch wound on his thigh, with his bone exposed. Germany is shocked. Lienen sees Bremen manager Otto Rehagel as the instigator of the foul. I think that's still in kind of way that he avoided. So, a hamstring injury, but uh, luckily a rare one uh, at this moment. So, at this time, it's more like the, um, the sprint type and uh, the stretch type we see during spring injuries. Um, what do I hear? Um, during uh, the strain injury, so an indirect type of hamstring injury. Uh, so we will talk more about this type of injuries because this is are the most common in men professional football. Then we also have the avulsion and of course we need to rule out this part because if it's like an avulsion, most of the time we will ha have to make another decision in the, in the um, treatment directly, so surgery or not, but of course we should not miss this part. Um, looking back at the sprint type and the stretch type, um, like it's say sprinting most of the time or core during sprinting and stretching is more like what you see with water skiing, like over stretching and also it's common in football, but more is the sprint type. So if we look more at the etiology about sprinting, we have different phases like swing phases early mid and late and then we have the, the stand phases like also again early mid and stand just before landing your uh, heel or foot depending your running technique this is the part where your hamstring injury most often occur like just before um, between the late swing and the early stance foot strike so before your feet, foot touches the ground. This is exactly when we see most of the time the sprint types. And then, yeah, if we have a problem, um, player is injured, we'll get from back off the field. Most of the time they know it themselves already that there is something wrong, they're running and all of a sudden they are laying on the ground, grab with their hand on their hamstring and they say, hmm, I don't think this is good. Um, so what do I have? Most of the time it's not the most difficult question to answer. Um, although um, it still is very important to have a good diagnosis. If we look at the clinical testing, it's not that good. The only test with a high diagnostic efficiency, effectiveness uh, is the taking of shoe test and all the other tests um, are very low to low diagnostic. So if you do physical examination, the best one is uh, still this. Ask the patient to take off, in this case, the left shoe with their heel um, against their other feet. And then um, if it's painful, it's like the most uh, important test, which has a perfect agreement clinical with the clinical testing and the ultrasound or the MRI, depending on what you use. Um, but then, Everybody wants to know when can we play again? When can the player play? When am I able to play my next match? Uh, a lot of information again from the um, hamstring injury uh, research done by the, the UEFA group research group. So only the Champions League groups again. We see if there is structural damage for the hamstring injury, the players will be back for in the mean for 18 days or median 13 days, but it can depend 
like in between the 10th percentile for four days till the ninth percentile to 36 days. So it's a big range, but still with structural damage, you can be back in like four to 36 days. Doesn't seem that bad, but every day uh, not on the pitch, not playing, not training for a football trainer is horrible. And also for uh, the medical staff, it's best if they are back as soon as possible at the pitch because the medical room they don't like often. Um, and we love to see them back on the pitch. And then, of course, everybody thinks uh, or say or tell me, I need an MRI to know how long this will take because they think. Um, the MRI tells you everything, um, but is this true? So we will look at this. A lot of information, again, from Jan Ekstrand, the research group from Sweden. We will see if there is an MRI, an MRI scan from the hamstring injury, this professional football. Uh, we have the four grades. To, and then we see there is a significant difference because the P is smaller than 0 0.5. But the question is, is this also clinical relevant? Because it can be significant, but we are not sure if it's like relevant. So if we look at the 95% confidence interval for grade one, we see from left side, zero days, right side, 37 in this research found then we go to grade two we see on the right on the left side zero again so the same on the right 44 so the only difference is like a little difference on the right between the 37 and the 44 days so not that relevant clinically if you ask me so if we go to the coach and we tell him um, indeed like i think he will be back in zero to 44 days um, I think he will not be happy with me and I can leave. So we need to get better in this part. A lot of in, a lot of research about it, the hamstring injuries and the predicting the return to play. Now we know this all, I think, and you may be better than I know this research, uh, this papers. So a lot of things that we know, but in general at the moment for return to play, Still, the MRI is not uh, the best we have, but then we have this physical examination paper, and also this one uh, tells us the MRI has no added value, but what can we do to make the return to play prognosis a bit better? We see the clinical examination just after the injury on the left side and on the right side combined with uh, the clinical examination seven days after the injury if we combine those two we see that the 95 percent clearance interval is already a lot smaller and the prediction is a lot better so then we can add mri and it doesn't give us anything so what do, do we need to know? So there's a nice um, paper in the British Journal about it. It's already a bit old, but it's still we use it. Um, you can see like you can have this Excel, you can put in all the things you need to put in, and then he will tell you like uh, the predicted days to return to play. What is interesting, you see on the left, I put in just how many days until they start with physio? Zero. On the right, I put in two. And you see the difference from 11 to 19 days already predicted days return to play. Of course, there is no other values I put in, but you see like if you if there was a delay in the start with your rehab, the predicted days to return to play will differ a lot. If you make five days until start physio, it will be 29. So the importance of starting as soon as possible with your rehab um, is really, really, really important. So if we have a hamstring injury today and we have the MRI telling us it's a grade two, it will not say anything about the, predict the predicted return to play days, but if the player is able to run in the, the pool today, he will start running today. So we do everything we can directly. So how does the, the rehab looks like? 
um, from our colleagues, also from Spain and Qatar. Um, we will not say where in Spain, um, but there's a really nice uh, paper about the progressive um, algorithm for hamstring injuries and treatment. And you see if you follow this algorithm, the re-injuries will uh, go down from 25 to 4. The return to uh, sport time is a bit longer, like two days longer, but on 23 or 25 days, it's not that big difference if you can reduce the re-injury, although the coach will think different sometimes. And if we follow this algorithm, the sprint test uh, will be way better also. Um, you can see the different phases in, the, in this algorithm. So re regeneration phase, the functional phase, different variables, tests and criteria for progression. If you have them all checked, then you can go to the next phase. If not, you go back and uh, go on in the regeneration phase. The biggest difference between the regeneration phase and the other phase, the next phase, of course, is the, the difficulty in the exercises, but also um, no massage on the injury side. Really important in Spain. It's um, different. We we do a lot of massage and also directly after the hamstring or other injury. So that's very interesting, but um, we try to and stay off right now. So when you did this all and you checked all the, the tests, you can go from the regeneration phase to the functional phase. Uh, again, a lot of exercises in this really nice algorithm to do, to build up your rehab and to uh, progress step by step. Um, in general, it's an eccentric exercise therapy. It has to be pain-free training with a good neuromuscular control of hip, pelvis and knee and a build-in end up speed and explosiveness. So the last part, the return to play. When can I play again? Most important part. Um, from my colleague from Nick van der Horst, a really nice uh, Delphi study has been done. He asked all kind of hamstring experts all over the world. Uh, about their opinion about the return to play and the hamstring injuries. In general, this return to play model gives us it's a shared decision making, really, really important. It depends all, like mentioned earlier already, on the athlete, the head coach, physical therapist, sports physician and the, the fitness trainer. So the better the communication with these people, the better the rehab and return to play without uh, re-injuries. So which kind of criteria has to be included? The absence of pain on palpation, the absence of pain during strength and flexibility testing, as well as the absence during functional performance and pain after functional testing. Similar hamstring flexibility, psych psychological readiness, um, and um, the athlete has to have their confidence in the process and being ready mentally for uh, the next game. Then we have performance testing on the field, like for example, sprint ability testing, deceleration, single leg bridge, and position specific GPS, really, really important, really depends where on the field the player is and what are the, what are the normal GPS data pre-injury. And then the medical staff clearance most important return to play criteria at the moment. Um, so you go out with your team, talk about it, and depending on what uh, match we have ahead and um, how the player feel if he or she wants to play, you make the decision and together you stick on it. It can be possible that the sports physician or someone else in the team has doubts about um, the, um, the goal, but if we have the goal, we will go for it together. And if we fail, okay, then we failed. Luckily, we didn't have one re-injury the whole season. But of course, it's possible because you want to have your return to play as soon and as quick as possible. So you take risks. And sometimes the risks are higher than other times because you have a Champions League match or another really important cup final. Um, 
so then the prevention because if the player is back on the pitch playing we don't want to have a re-injury um for hamstring injuries there's a lot of it a lot of data uh, available about injuries re-injuries and prevention but the thing is if you have um, good prevention protocols still the clubs have to build it in their training um, and that's like the the biggest difficulty because with every three days a match um, where and when and how are we going to do this nice Nordics or other exercises uh, which are um, proven to be effective um, and on the other side we do a lot of lot of lot of sprint training in the training but also of course in a match so this is also a prevention strategy for hamstring injuries so all these nice things the Nordics we're talking about um, how is it possible that still a lot of clubs don't do it like i mentioned like it's difficult with the three uh, games a week uh, sorry three games yeah a week or every three days a game to build it in um but it's not everything because now we're just talking about all the 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 um, um, like workload, physical uh, risk factors for injuries, but there's way more than only the thing we are looking at the moment because it's not just the phys the body uh, and the injury, it's way more risk factors in uh, men's football and women's football, of course. So that's also where we have to, to look at. And the workload is one, um, but the player's well-being is considered also a really, really high um risk factor if the player has a lot of stress or other things in something happened with their wives or their kids whatever um it's also really important to know this kind of things and to tackle this risk factor and then the quality of internal communication between the medical staff the technical staff and everybody around the team everybody has to have the same vision and talk about the same goals with the player because otherwise, if there is some uh, thing unclear, it's really important to tackle it directly. And then also we have the head coach leadership style, um, like the chief medical officer from the UEFA Champions League clubs um, pointed out, this is a really, really important risk factor, the way the head coach is leading his or her team. So they looked further at this, and what they saw again from the research group, um, a correlation between the head coach leadership style versus the incidence of severe injuries in men professional football, the players availability and also like a 30 or 40 percent lower incidence of severe injuries in teams where coaches communicated a clear positive vision of the future, supported staff members and gave staff encouragement and recognition. And last, also the training attendance was higher in teams where coaches gave encouragement and recognized staff members, encouraged innovative thinking, and also has trust and cooperation among the team members and acted as role models for their players. And I think if we look at our last season, this is, uh, yeah, we, you can see it all at our team and the way the the head coach is leading his team so then we're at the key points um prognosis cannot be accurately determined immediately after the injury repeated clinical evaluation provides more information and the mri or ultrasound doesn't have an added value Treatment and prevention, an active approach directly when you can do things, go ahead, start with your physiotherapy, start with your training, uh, all pain free, but start. And then the return to play, it depends all of, on the shared decision making and the, the criteria based medical clearance. Thank you very much. This was it.